Hello. Uh, continuing on with uh, disorders of early childhood in childhood psychopathology, we're going to talk uh, in this next lecture uh, about feeding and sleep disorders. So basic um, uh, sort of rudimentary disorders uh, of um, sleeping. Uh, unfortunately, those don't go away as we grow up. Some of them, well, not all of them. Some of them get worse as we get older, as some of you may have discovered. Um, and feeding disorders, uh, there are some fairly rare ones we'll talk about. Uh, generally, it's uh, just getting, it's fussy eaters, uh, is sort of the best way to think about it. Um, but as we get into this sort of early development, uh, problems with feeding and sleeping can be particularly distressing for caregivers, um, oftentimes more so than their children. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, beliefs about uh, when kids should be sleeping, how much they should be sleeping, um, how much they should be eating. And sometimes it's it's going to take a little while to figure out, and not every child is the same. Now, some very rare disorders uh, include uh, something called pica, which is uh, the ingestion of non-food substances, paint, pebbles, dirt, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> you know, kids put everything in their mouth, so they're probably going to try to eat something now and then. This is the constant um, ingestion of, you know, eating dirt. Not good for you. Um, <clears throat> rumination is the repeated regurgitation of food, um, which can be uh, both um, psychological and physical. So obviously, physician is going to be the first person to see for that. Um, but there can be um, some uh, associations with food. Any of you who might have, oh, I don't know, overindulged in um, a specific liquor will find oftentimes that you can't have that anymore because it will cause you to regurgitate. It's a basic biological function that keeps um, you from ingesting poison uh, uh, repeatedly. <clears throat> and so uh, that can be part of that is it could ha can be that um, they're regurgitating food because of that kind of reflex. Uh, much more common are feeding disturbances not related to eating. Uh, we call this avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And uh, we're going to get into that in more detail here in a moment. Uh, Sleep-wake sleep -wake disorders are just disruptions of basic functioning. Um, and, of course, uh, these can take a variety of um, paths a little bit later on in childhood. But let's get into avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Uh, I start from the start. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, sort of involved in learning how to eat. So feeding involves the integration and coordination of uh, internal processes as well as relational processes. Um, and so um, as infants start feeding and move from breastfeeding to bottle feeding um, and then into um, eating uh, sort of solid air foods, uh, baby food, that sort of thing, um, we start to see them um, developing potentially some of these kind of relational processes between the food and an infant. Um, so by the time they transition to solid foods, at about four to six months, um, generally we have pleasant patterns of interaction between infants and their parents have evolved, and, um, and so this is a good positive experience. Um, can, however, uh, go south. Um, the responses of caregivers can exacerbate the situation and in return impact the parenting relationship. So one of the things is if you're distressed, uh, your infant's going to know you're distressed. And so you want to be very careful in how you approach uh, your responses uh, to children. Um, you know, calm, um, dealing with that. Don't panic. Um, don't try to force kids to eat. You know, you want to be, you want to make the relationship is what's going to help um, get you through uh, this kind of problem. Obviously, that's often e easier said than done. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, feeding difficulties may be the result of developmental delays, uh, genetic conditions, abnormalities of oral anatomy. So obviously, physician visit, dentist visits might be in order. Um, some infants may be less sensitive to feelings of hunger or may present signals that are unclear or difficult to read by their caregivers. Um, you know, infants can't say, you know, I'm hungry, I need to eat. And so uh, interpreting their um, communication is going to be important to that. Uh, kids, kids are very good at learning what gets them what they want and what doesn't get them what they want. And so 
uh, watching for those signals is important. Uh, temperamental differences can also come into play. Um, children who are highly reactive to new stimuli tend to respond more negatively to the introduction of new tastes and textures. So um, <clears throat> that's something we want to keep in mind. Uh, parenting decisions related to routine and timing of feeding may also have an impact. Um, we're going to talk about that here in a moment for uh, treatment of these issues. Um, because as um, uh, we'll discover is oftentimes you kind of have to just wait for an infant to get hungry. Um, and so that might be part of that. Uh, and some of this can be classical conditioning where I talk about post-traumatic feeding disorder. Um, infants that have had some kind of oral trauma, sometimes they've had to have some sort of esophageal surgery or had to be intubated, um, that sort of thing. <coughs> um, can have uh, some difficulties with um, feeding. And so we need to sort of get them past that association with food. Uh, we also have to think about uh, potential if uh, an infant might be what we call a super taster. Uh, super tasters oftentimes are very difficult to try to transition to food uh, because things taste very intense. Um, so about 25% of the population have significantly greater numbers of papillae, which are the taste buds. Um, and uh, as a result, foods have a much stronger flavor, uh, oftentimes particularly bitter foods, uh, fatty and sugary foods. So you have to think about um, whether or not your child might be one of these super tasters. There's online test kits you can order um, to see if you can detect um, flavors at lower thresholds. Um, of course, keep in mind some genotypes experience taste differently. I'm one of those people who does not care for cilantro because it tastes like soap to me, and that's a specific genotype. And so uh, some of this can be completely unrelated to any psychology, but a lot more to do with uh, physiology. And so um, certainly I would say, um, you know, obviously you're not trying to feed your infant um, spicy buffalo wings and uh, burritos, but um, you want to really start with bland, simple foods. Um, Fortunately, uh, this is one of those things once kids start to grow up, they learn what they like um, and tend to do fine. Uh, oftentimes, they do have difficulty maintaining calorie, um, high caloric density because they don't like fat or sugar, um, which some days I think might be nice. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, that's a little bit about super taster. So this could be something else entirely. Um, so how do we assess and diagnose this problem? It all depends on, of course, establishing a therapeutic alliance with the child's caregiver. The child's not going to be able to tell you what's going on. Um, you have to recognize the role of parental factors in the cause and or maintenance of the disorder. This doesn't mean blaming parents. It just means, you know, this isn't, this isn't the parent's fault. Uh, it's just simply this. The pattern of eating has gotten out of um, alignment and, you know, getting them on the right track. And so uh, we don't want to blame the parents. We want to make sure that we're saying, okay, well, why don't we try this instead? That sort of thing. Um, detailed feeding histories are uh, going to be really important. Uh, time, uh, exactly what you're trying to feed them, <clears throat> uh, that sort of thing. We also need to make sure that they've been to the physician so that they, we know infants are swallowing appropriately. There are no sores in their mouth, um, that sort of thing, because obviously um, if eating is causing pain, then uh, that's going to be a problem, and so we want to make sure we can uh, deal with those sorts of things. Uh, intervention, generally focused on the interplay between physiological, behavioral, and environmental factors. Kind of depending on what we have going on in symptoms and infant caregiver uh, pairs, generally we want to do empirically supported behavioral interventions. Um, so, um, I've had my class reading, those of you who are in my class, um, a pretty interesting three-part strategy on treating this sort of post-traumatic food disorder. Uh, basically changes in feeding schedules to try to induce hunger. Um, you know, kids are hungry, they're more likely to eat. Uh, certainly close nutritional monitoring. Uh, one of the things they do sometimes is sort of low volume but high caloric density um, feeding so that you don't have to get a lot of food into um, the infant, just enough uh, to get them um, uh, fed appropriately. 
And then some behavioral modification techniques to sort of change those negative associations with food. And this is where we start thinking about this as sort of a classical condition, because essentially with uh, post-traumatic feeding disorder is they've been classically conditioned to fear um, anything in their mouth. And so getting them away from that is going to be important. And so we'll have to think about uh, ways we can use these behavioral modification techniques uh, to do that. All right, so that is feeding disorders. Um, Sleep-wake disorders include insomnia, this is difficulties in falling or staying asleep. Um, with infants, this is one of those things um, It's a little more difficult to deal with um, because you know, we really the only things we can do is try some environmental interventions. Um, disorders of sleep arousal, so sleep terrors or sleepwalking. <laughs> this is the picture, by the way, I found when I googled sleep terrors. Um, so um, uh, you're welcome, or I'm sorry, because it might be keeping you up at night. <clears throat> um, sleep terrors are uh, generally a childhood disorder, although they can uh, move into adulthood. Uh, these involve uh, sort of waking up screaming. Um, yeah, and absolute terror, um, facial expressions of terror, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then sleepwalking is, I know, sleepwalking. Uh, biggest thing to keep in mind with sleepwalking is you want to wake them up. This myth about not waking sleepwalkers is a myth. Wake them up because otherwise they might do something uh, and injure themselves. Uh, nightmare disorder. This is when uh, children are just having um, lots of nightmares. Again, one of those things will probably grow out of. Um, they do, these kind of sleep difficulties tend to resolve, resolve over time. Um, night waking problems tend to decrease over time. Sleep onset and bedtime resistance, bedtime struggles are going to be uh, sort of stable and might increase in frequency or severity. Um, but certainly throughout the early years, adequate sleep is essential. Actually, your entire life, adequate sleep is essential for our cognitive, emotional, and social development. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we want to uh, think very carefully about um, making sure our kids have uh, good sleep. Individual variations in self-regulation might be part of the causes of this disorder, um, underlying differences in arousal and attention systems. Some people are uh, simply a little bit more vigilant, and so they may um, sort of have a higher level of overall arousal. Um, parental factors such as problematic conditions Cognitions, sorry, uh, related to setting limits uh, can be a problem. So enforcing bedtime. Um, we also want to differentially diagnose anxiety or depression. Um, and so uh, sleep disorders may be secondary to anxiety or depression. Um, certainly anxiety, depression, um, it's both oftentimes more difficult to sleep or they're sleeping very, very long hours. Uh, we want to think about emergence of sleep disorders versus maintenance of sleep disorders and how they might um, come about. And so what are the factors that cause it versus what are the things that are ongoing that maintain that sleep disorder? And so things like enforcing bedtime, that needs to be ongoing. Um, things like environmental issues can be maintaining sleep disorders, that sort of thing. Uh, it's sort of difficult to know. When to diagnose a sleep disorder, um, here's the thing with diagnosis. Um, everything is uh, culturally and contextually founded. Um, one of the things, a lot of people who are home on quarantine, it's currently, we're now into May 2020, um, is, you know, patterns of sleep are changing dramatically um, during times of stress, uh, et cetera. And so it's sort of difficult to know what's a disorder versus what's not. Um, sort of we want to do overall health and development. Sleep diaries um, are requested from parents. Uh, sometimes a sleep study might be uh, need to be done. So it uh, will be observed and physically monitored um, because we want to rule out physiological complications, things like sleep apnea. We can also um, uh, throw some 
electrodes on, see if they have any uh, EEG brain water problems. <clears throat> Sorry, are they going through the stages of sleep like they should, um, etc. Uh, basically, um, sleep disorders are difficult to treat in everyone. Um, focusing on a relationship with parents, um, other dynamically oriented approaches, other behavioral therapy approaches are difficult <laughs> and very ineffective in uh, infants. You know, really, it's about um, getting a routine established and making sure that we have thought about environmental interventions, making sure it's quiet, it's dark, um, et cetera. Uh, drug treatments sometimes included. Um, uh, it's This is one of those things that uh, long-term consequences are certainly going to be an issue, and, and particularly with an infant, uh, I would. this is uh, an approach I would never recommend. Um, uh, because getting the dosing right is very, very difficult, and uh, we certainly don't want to have um, those kind of issues. But I think a lot of it has to do with just setting boundaries, guidelines, etc., um, and making sure bedtime, uh, as children get older, uh, that bedtimes are enforced. Okay, um, in uh, the next lecture, we'll get into talking about attachment disorders, which I clearly misspelled. All right, we'll see you.